It means that which is strange or foreign to you. And they extrapolate it in our political arena. As you're a xenophobic, you don't like anything that's foreign to you. Well, um, you're, you're bastardizing what the word means. Xeno means anything foreign to me. And all of us have a xenophobia about something. And if you don't, then that must mean you eat anything that's put in front of you. Do you? Monkey brains, roaches, spiders. Really? You eat those Chinese Malaysian dishes where they took the insects and go right in front of you? You do that. You go to the Korean chop shop, see what they give you? Not make fun, I'm just saying. You do that. Yeah, right, stop lying. All of us have a xenophobia about something that's foreign or strange to us, whether it's whatever it is, okay? Even people, by the way, yes, we have a xenophobia about certain people. If a certain person is carrying, is having a long jacket on and glasses in the middle of summer, you might walk the other way. If a person has the Doberman Pinscher on, on a leash, you might cross the street before he walks towards you. <laughs> I'm just saying. You tend to walk differently, actively on people that, that are strange to you. Now, so anyway, he says you were strangers from the covenants. That means you had, you were, you were again, not, you weren't just related to God as not part of the, you not just were aliens estranged, but you were also strangers. You were foreign. You had no knowledge of. You were, you were foreigners to the covenants. Look, look, at, look at the word for covenant. It's plural. The covenants of the promise. A hope not having, and, a, and you were godless in the world. So you had no hope. You had no God. The word godless means you had no God without a God. So the Gentiles, he's reminding them who you were. Those who were of the Harmusia and the, and the Paraptoma. Uh, those who weren't of covenant at all and were made proselytes and you are made this. Remember where you came from. You had no God and you were a covenant. You had no hope. And now you also had no commonwealth in Israel and you, had, you were strangers to the covenants. Covenants, plural. That's right, the word is plural. Look at the word there, ton, covenant. Say there, so it's the ton, which makes it plural. So look at the words. So if you go over to Romans, there's only one other time in the New Testament where, where Paul, or the, or the Lord makes Paul write this, or anybody else in the New Testament, write the words plural that I, that I could find. It's in, it's in, um, it's in Romans chapter nine. And in verse 4, and he says, Who are Israelites to whom belong the sonship and the glory and the covenants, plural, and the law giving and the rights of service and the promises. So the question is, going back to um, Ephesians, what is meant by the covenants? What's he mean that, you're, that you were not of the commonwealth of Israel, but you were, straight, you were foreign from the covenants? In other words, they didn't apply to you. The covenants are promised. What covenants are those? You know. All right, there's the covenant of Abraham in Genesis 12, right? There was, there was the covenants of, number one, there was the Ab Abrahamic. And that was, remember if you remember, that was the promised, the promised blessing. I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. Does sound familiar? Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. But then there's another covenant God made, and that's the Mosaic. You say, why is that? Well, remember now, a covenant's without blood. There was no blood involved in this Genesis one. There's no blood here when he told, when he told um, Moses, this is the promised land. When he told them in Deuteronomy, about living a certain way. And if you do a certain, you live a certain way, then I'll take care of you as my kids. And if you don't, I'll pick your hind parts and I ain't playing with you. And then of course, there's the Davidic covenant that he made, which again is the promise of Messiah. That's not to Jews. That's before Jews. You're right. You're right. That's not to Jews, though. And then there's this one here, and that's in Psalm. If you're with Nancy, she says there's no Attic covenant, too, and there is. But that's to um, pre-Jewish people. That's not. They were Hebrews first, then they were Israelites second, then they were Jews third. So he made an Abrahamic covenant. He would bless them no matter what. He made a Mosaic covenant. 
So he made these two. This one, this one's unconditional. This one was conditional. And this one was unconditional. That's why when I actually talk to people in marriage counseling, I always say, what's a covenant? And they go, um, <laughs> so they, they hardly ever know what it is. And I say, well, it's a promise that, that God makes to us that you can actually, it's, it's, a, it's a promise, an assurance you can count on. Here's the real trick question. Is it conditional or unconditional? Is it bilateral or unilateral? Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> and they give a guess, and I say, and they always get it wrong because the answer is yes, it's both. Unilateral, <laughs> right? That's what that unconditional means, unilateral. It's only based on God. Nothing to do with us. And this is bilateral. We've got to do something. And this is unilateral. But these are examples of how people want to paint God into this one uh, thought process. So, so that... Salvation of the Spirit is the unilateral, but uh, the soul... The soul is bilateral. bilateral. Yeah. Yeah. So people want to say things like, they'll say, well, they'll see that what you just said, and they'll go, all God does is bilateral. But then when it comes to like going through tough times in life and trauma, and they say, no, no, God will take care of everything. You don't have to do nothing. They want to see God, you know, they want to see God in whatever way fits their agenda, given their circumstance, or given the issue that's at hand. It's amazing. But when in fact, he's both. I, I, you can't pick and choose what you want. It's like saying, look, you don't have to like all of me. And I know there's a lot not to like, but the reality is, let's get real. I have issues, okay? So if you say, well, I like Preston, da 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 but I don't like Preston, da 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 Well, that's both true. You can't say, well, you know, he's not that, so I don't want to talk about it. No, I'm still that. Whether you don't want to talk about it or not, it's still a reality that I have to accept. We all have our flaws, right? We all got our good things, we got our bad things. So it, you, you can't just take somebody's traits you don't like even though they're not bad to everybody, but they're bad to you. I remember when we first got, we first met, Babes and I, she didn't like my laugh. It was too loud, it was too whatever. But now she doesn't mind it as much, I don't think. So, so the reality is that you, even though people have a trick tendencies, you tend to um, grow in time to look at them differently, which I think is the same with the scripture. People see God unilaterally, unconditional, they see him conditional, but the more they learn, the more they realize he's both. And if you're willing to learn and grow and be teachable, you'll understand more about God. But you can't just continue to put him into this, he's one or the other. No, he's, and these are proof of that. It's right there on the board for you. So when Paul says they were strangers to the covenants of the promise, he's talking about Gentiles, you had no blessing, you had no land, and you had no deliverer. You got nothing. You got nothing. You got no past. You got no past, you got no past reality that you're always being loved by God. You have no present in your lifetime what you're looking for, that you can actually rest in your land that God gave you. God gave you no land. God gave you no blessing to live through until you get to that land or rest in that land. And God still didn't give you any future reality of the Messiah. Not to mention, they also have, they also have a new covenant given to them. That's out ahead. If you want to count the new covenant, that's like an extra credit covenant that God gave them. And that's in Jeremiah when he tells them in the, in the, the new days out ahead, he's going to give them, and he's going to write on their, on their hearts, give them a new heart, not a heart of stone. Remember that? That's right here in, the, and in Jeremiah 31, 34, and in Ezekiel. He makes a new covenant with them as well. So to be fair, Israel has three covenants, but a new one yet to come. What do Gentiles got? Zero. <laughs> they got nothing. Nothing. Zero. And so Paul's going, do you, know, do you understand where you've come from? Do you even understand? Because I'm a Jew, Paul would say. I got all this. And I'm telling you, I'm blown away by what he did for me and knocked me out of my keister in Damascus. What he's doing for y'all is wild. And it's just crazy. And what you don't understand is not only what you have, but given where you've come from, you had none of this. Not, at least I can kind of get why he's blessing me because he already, in the past, if I kind of think about it, he's really blessed Abraham. He didn't ask for it. He, he blessed Moses, and he didn't ask for it. And same with David. He didn't ask for it. I mean, Jesse had to, Jesse had to go get him because they thought he was a throwaway, the youngest little boy. So those three guys were all like, you know, humble guys when God met them, and they weren't like godly people at the time, except for David. 
He was living godly, but those two weren't. So, okay, and over here, that's, they, eh, that's not, they weren't doing well, which is why he does this. So of all, of all the four covenants, only one, you can probably say David was living good, but then again, he didn't turn out staying that way, right? So, but Paul can get the idea why God would bless people that he already gave all this to. But the Gentiles, he, they, they're like scum. They're like, you know, why would you give to them? They're the ones who were the problems to these people. They were the ones who were always trying to make sure these covenants weren't happening. They, they, they were the enemies. I don't understand. This is crazy. And so he talks about this. It's profound when he says, you don't understand, guys. You had no God. You had no hope. You had no covenant. And now you've been given the highest of all heights blessings that are transcending and exceeding all wealth abundantly in God's grace. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? And they're like, uh, no. I know you don't. Because you don't understand what I'm saying to you. You don't, under, you don't understand. It transcends every story in the Old Testament. It transcends every person's experience of a burning bush, of a cloud speaking. Of all. It transcends all that. You don't understand. <laughs> He's trying to tell them how what a big deal this is. And so he says in verse 13, but now we're almost at the end of our lesson for today. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you, you, the oi, he said, I love the oi, it means those you, those of you, once being far off, it's Macron, from a far distance, near you were made, or close, which is genoma, you began to be near, in the blood of the anointed. You began to be made near. That was your first step, in other words. He for, he for is the peace of us, all of us, not just the specific us of this hundred, full, this hundred fruit people, but the, the, the bride people, but of all of us, there are of the mature ones, which is 30 fruit, 60 fruit, 100 fruit people of the sperma. He's the peace for all of us because Himon at this point, right here, this word, Himon, the one having made things one, having removed the enmity of the middle wall of partition. Whew. He removed the middle wall, the word middle wall, I'm going to write it on the board for you. So he takes this middle wall, and the middle wall is, it's mesotoshan, and it means partition wall. Whoop. So people get the idea that this is the wall of the Holy of Holies, and, and it's not, a, it's a, that was a curtain. No, 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 no. This is a partition wall, the barrier. So what he's talking about is this. In the past, you had, you, had, you had the tabernacle set up, right? It was set up, and you had the Holy of Holies here. Then you had the Most Holy Place here. But then out here, you had the, this is the, this is the, whoop, this is the inner courtyard. And then all the tribes were camped outside here, remember? And this was the outer courtyard. And if you were a Jew or a Gentile, you had to go right in here. You had to go in this way with a sacrifice. You had to go with a sacrifice, right, to get in here. So he's telling, he's, telling, he's saying, this is gone. This is gone. <laughs> There's no more. That, that wall that said, we're the Jews. We have access to God's sacrifice and God's love and kindness and forgiveness. Stay out. You have sacrifice? Stay out. That's gone. It's gone. <laughs> and they're like, huh? He's like, it's gone. Th this whole thing is gone. The outside framework is no longer there. It's open access. It's like having a, having a house. We call it, we call it, oh, what is it called? Open floor plan. Open floor plan in your house. It's like a house you used to have, the old fashioned houses had a living room and a, and, a, and a family room and a this room and a that room. And there's the houses today that are more open floor plans. That's what God did here. This is a, this is a, this is a categorized house and God made an open floor plan. No more walls. But the outside wall is what he focused on. He said the outside partition wall is gone. Now you still got to approach the right way through your heart being contrite and so forth. That's what these represent still, that you have to confess and repent. That's why there's two partition walls there, by the way. <laughs> you have to agree with God that you're not holy. Yeah. And then you have to re re return away from your sin and turn to God 
in order to approach this throne of grace with boldness, as he says in Hebrews. So you can do that, but that's why there's two walls. They don't exist in a sense of resisting you. They exist as a reminder to you that you have to, and I have to, confess and repent. That's why they exist. We have to agree with God that we're not holy, but he's made us holy in Christ. So we have to live in that sanctification by putting off our sin and taking on uh, the word of God to wash us. And so because of then the repentance is to deal with turning away from our sin and turning to him, right? So that's how you can approach the Holy of Holies. When you have your mind changed toward turning away from sin and, and, and looking to God to, to restore you. So with that being said, in, in Ephesians uh, 15, in verse 15, he says, Having by his, this is, so, this is so fantastic how he ends this up. I get to finish this, but he says, Having by his flesh annulled the law. Oh, man. It says made powerless. It, it's so, uh, it's awesome. So he says, having by his flesh annulled the law, it means to make power, it means to katageo. I, I, I think of that word categorically, but it we don't get our word from this, but it, it reminds me of it. He says, katageo, utterly to, of no effect. The law is utterly of no effect, what it means. So, because the word, it reads, it, the words argeo means to uh, have an effect. And kata is, a, is an emphasize of utterly. So to utterly make of no effect the law. So for those of, those of our Seven Day Adventist friends, those of our Hebrew Roots Movement friends, those of our other in-between friends who want to tell us to go to worship on the Sabbath, to do these things in the Old Testament, because the law, the law, the law, the law, I am the law. Well, wait a minute, because Jesus is the law. Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And the whole word of God, the written word, exists in him. He fulfilled it. He was nailed to a cross. And that's why it says he categorically, or categorio, he utterly made it of no effect. It's powerless. Got nothing on you and me. Got nothing on us. We're done with that. Now, unfortunately for you and me, we tend to think that's great news and that we're away from any responsibility and accountability. That'd be a lie. Because now instead of being held accountable and responsible to a book, uh, 39 books of what to say and what to do, what not to say, what not to do, and what to eat, and what not to eat, and where to go, not to go. Now we have this, uh, um, oh yeah, Jesus guy, Yeshua, who said all this stuff in the New Testament and the Gospel accounts and all through the Apostle writers and said, uh, you got to do this. <laughs> it's a lot more involved if you think about it because the Old Testament was a lot of stories. There's the law, but a lot of that was dietary, not that hard to do. I mean, but this is hard to do, man, because this is stuff about how we have to act toward each other. Back then, they could just, oh, you were a witch? You were a witch? Stone her! You're rebellious? Stone her! Jeez. Back now, God goes, rebellious? Forgive her. What? Receive him. Huh? Take on the other cheek and have him strike. What? Because before you let it, the law was kind of easy to follow, in a, in a way, because you could, you just, you would, in a way it was, because you could actually just, you know, justify their your human thoughts about how you could treat people. Eye if for an eye. eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. They rebelled, you, you bust them up. But now God, Jesus says, no, I tell you the truth. If it, after, your, after your coat, give them your tunic also. What? But, huh? <laughs> you know, he's, oh, you've heard it said that you love those that love you and hate those that hate you. I tell you that even, even, if, 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 even the taskmasters can love those that love them. You want to love those that hate you. Then you do well. Love those that hate, love your enemies. What? Wait, 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 wait. Before you said, you know, we could just like annihilate them and just, you know, bring them to death. Like, you know, like the Jews did. Everybody that was an ite around them is no longer an ite. They were dead. The Philistine, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Jezebites, the, Can the Canaanites, they're dead. But then, then, but now God goes, we're not killing folks anymore. The, but I want to, I want to. <laughs> I mean, you, could, you know, if they're against me, you could just go wipe them out. But now God says, no, deal with them. What? It's harder to live this way. I, I would say that it is the law, because the law, you would eventually have God just take care of your problem. You know? Thank God, they're being evil. He goes, I got this. Sweet. <laughs> you know? so, but then you had a problem still, right? But now, God helps us in, inwardly, and so he wants us to relate to these people. He doesn't eliminate the problem. We have to deal with it. And it's really crazy. But So Paul's saying the partition wall has been eliminated, so we have access. But he says, and we do have access because... Because Jesus, having by his flesh annulled the law, he, the law there is the Torah. He's meaning the, the Torah specifically. When you see that phrase, ta nomion, the ta, the ta nomon, that is the law. 
If you see the word by itself, nomon or law, then that means the law of God in a general sense. But the Torah is noted as the article the in front of it. So he's saying he annulled the Torah. He made powerless, utterly to no effect, the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, and the Torah, of course, is what Moses was told to write in the midst of that. So then, that he might form, excuse me, he made the law of the, of the commandments concerning the ordinances. So he made the law, he, he, he again made the law of the commandments and ordinances powerless. So he says in there again, the flesh of himself, the law of the commandments, in ordinance, all God's decrees and dogmas was made powerless so that, so why was it, why did God make it to no effect and no, and no purpose? Because he not, didn't say no purpose, he said utterly no effect. That he might form in himself into one new man, making peace, that he might reconcile, which is that word epo catalasso, which is the phrasing for reconciling fully as a pation in sperma, so in other words, he wants us to at least have peace in the mysterion, secrets of the kingdom of the gods, which is what Paul's been teaching. The both in one body to the God through the cross. Now, I skipped ahead, didn't go back on that callous work. I got to go, so I'm trying to catch up on time. So what we're going to do, we're going to stop here. I'm going to go back and review again. I, there's other verses I just realized. There's about eight other verses I wanted to show you when I got those in callous work. I didn't show you. I want to go to that, then I also want to go and pick up here, finish chapter 2, and go into this, this last piece here we just left off on where he says, reconcile into one body. I want you to know this. This word for one is the word eni. When the word eni is used like this, it's different than when, you, when he says the word eni, he could have used the word differently for uh, the word one. When it's the I at the end of it, when you see that eni with the I at the end of it, it he's referring to a specific uh, body. So let me, let me give you an example uh, as I end this. So in 1 Corinthians 12, in 1 Corinthians 12, um, if you look into uh, chapter 12, verse 13, on this word one, this is just a preface into next week's study. He says in verse chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, verse 13, even for in one, eni, Spirit, we all into one in body. We're dipped. You see that? Or immersed. So the word for one is different. One has an I at the end and one doesn't. And when you look at why that is, it's because the, the letter I does not mean. So when you say one, so in other words, here's his way to use it. Here's the way to use So the word in would be used if I said, I'm using, I'm using one of my fingers. I'm using any. E-N-I, a specific one of my fingers, of my many fingers, right? So I'm pointing out one amongst many. So when I say one, I'm pointing out a distinguishment. Eni means a distinguishment. When I say one in, and I'm not using any, I'm using a, a phrase that means a, a unity, a group of, the one, okay? So it's interesting how, for example, I say that to say this, and I'm going to point this out later on when we get together. But that's why, for those who want to come against us and say, where do you get this soma body and this soma joint body? Well, why do you think he says, speaking to the group he's talking to, remember the group he's talking to, the audience and group in Ephesians is who? People who have the sperma at a high level of maturity, producing 1,600 fruit as the main audience, with 30 fruit in the hindsight audience. But he says, he's particularly been lately on these group of people, but mainly the 100 fruit people. And he says that he might reconcile both in any body, in one body, a specific body. What do you mean? Why don't you just say one, in? Why do you, why, if, it's just, if it's just one body of Christ, why do you not just say in for, for the one that involves all of us? Why do you say any to re represent a specific one amongst what? Another body. And that's why he says later on, again, in the same context, he'll use this phrase toward the spirit constantly to show you when he says later on in verse 18, in in one spirit, in any spirit of the Father, because there's the spirit of Christ, and there's the spirit of the Father. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Father. The spirit of Christ is from, from Christ. So this is the Holy Spirit he's referencing in verse 18, which is why he says any spirit, because there's two spirits, as we know. The Holy Spirit and the spirit of Christ, two different spirits. One's of the Father, one's of the Son. So interesting, uh, another elaboration there to expound on our understanding of these, of these, these verses. We'll get to this. 
But then I want to also, as a uh, heads up, get you ahead of time uh, as we end here also for today. In chapter 3, uh, looking ahead, notice how he says in, in verse 2, uh, since indeed, it was in verse 1, for this, for this cause I, Paul, am the prisoner on the account of you, the Gentiles, since indeed you heard the administration, which is meaning the stewardship that he has, and he goes on. So he's basically summarizing his entrance into this letter. The first two chapters, part plus the first five verses after chapter three, are a introduction as to why he's about to tell him what he's going to tell him. It's, it's like, wow. So the first two chapters up to verse five are nothing more, I should say nothing more, are all about, they're more than that, but they're all about Paul's introducing who they are, where they've come from, the gravity of the inheritance they've been given, the surpassing wealth of what it is, what it took for God to do it. All this stuff is like, he's just trying to make sure they understand. Do you know who you are? Do you know where you've come from? Do you know what God has done for you? Do you understand this? Because before I go into anything further, you need to get a good handle on this. It's kind of a big deal. And then in verse 6, and he starts talking about other stuff to define more details to what it means. But the first two chapters plus the first five verses of chapter three, he's just going off on, you don't know, man. You don't know. You don't know. <laughs> you know, like you don't, you wish you knew. You think you know what you think you know. Even I don't really realize what I know. Cause I went to heaven, I was like, blah, blah, blah. I'm just telling you, it's crazy talk. It's just, it's really wild stuff, what God has done for you. And so it's really, really, he's just, he's really excited and exuberant and trying to let them understand the, the, the unbelievable, nature of God's love and shedding abroad on our, our hearts, which by the way, it would be similar to it's fair for us in this congregation, I'll end with this, for God to be talking to you specifically when you hear this. So in this congregation, he's talking to you. So when you hear these people getting, getting lavished on by God's love and Paul saying, oh man, if you only knew, if you need to realize, take that in personal, because you should. It's personal to you. Take this letter of Ephesians personally to you. Because you should and you can spiritually, technically, because it is applying to you, all who hear me and this congregation. Yes? Ted said in the past you taught that E and I meant first as opposed to one. Is that still valid? Yeah, yeah, because it has a, it has, you're, you're correct, it has a ordinal, it has a ordinal um, and cardinal relationship to it. So, yes, it has that relationship to it as, as protos and Protos does, that's where that first comes from, because it does have a ordinal and cardinal background to it. That is true. But first, to, to, to your point, by the way, first represents one of others, right? So that's why I'm just trying to um, elaborate more as to what that means. But it, it, in, its, in its cardinal ordinal, ordinal number element, it means that. But to extrapolate more, it means uh, one of different of other ones, which is what first is. If there's a first, and there's a second and a third, you know. Yes? And she said, as in first body of Christ? Yep, yep. Yep, but the first, yeah, when I said, for, yeah, first, as in the protos, which would be correct, because on would be the one, the mia, and then protos, the oni, would be the first, which is the susoma, the joint. She said, okay. Yeah, you're, you're spot on, you're right. You're exactly right, you're spot on. If you look it up yourself, you'll find out you're spot on, that the, the, the ani, eni, the oni, eni, is uh, also a, um, root of the cardinal ordinal numbers, which parallels to the protos aspect of first, yes. All right, so we'll close in prayer. We're over. I do apologize. Let's, let's close and pray. So, Father, we thank you for this time and opportunity we had to gather together with you. Thank you for all you continue to do and have done in our lives. Help us and teach us, continue to grow us in the next week as we come back together together to be with you, and we just thank you in all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, a couple things to announce. Number one.